All right. Well, it's what a morning. Better together. Better together. In chapter 17 of the book of Acts, we left Paul in a place called Athens. Paul had arrived in Athens by himself. He preached while he was there by himself. And he left by himself. And I think Athens was probably particularly discouraging to Paul. Because number one, they were a, they were a totally carnal city. They had over 300 different uh, idols that they worshipped in, in, uh, in Athens. He didn't end up leaving Athens with it saying, oh, and a bunch of people got saved and a church was started there. It only mentions a couple, couple people at the end of chapter 17 that, that got saved. And so there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, of that, that was produced out of his preaching. And so he leaves there and he goes to Corinth. Now Corinth... Um, so Athens, Paul is in Athens right here, very small city, and he goes 55 miles over to Corinth. Now Corinth is, is a fairly large city, and it's interesting, it's a, it's a seaport, and it has two seaports. Corinth, the city, uh, or the city sits up here on this hill, and they have a big temple up on their hill to a god by the name of Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the god of love. And not the kind of love that we think of as godly love. The temple to Aphrodite had a thousand temple prostitutes. Now, I told you that Corinth had two seaports. Now this, this little isthmus right here, the isthmus is three and a half miles wide. So to avoid having to sail 200 miles out through the uh, Mediterranean Sea in their small boats, they, they would come through the Gulf of Corinth, come up to the first seaport, seaport and then they would roll their boats up onto rollers, and they'd roll them three and a half miles into the Saconic Sea. Saronic, so, Saronic Sea. Okay, the Saronic Gulf. And then they could go from there, they could go up into the Aegean Sea, or they could go down into the Mediterranean Sea. But it would save them days of sailing. And so, and it was much safer because they were always in protected waters. Well, with ships come what? Sailors. <laughs> lots of sailors. And lots of people. Can you imagine what it would take to roll a ship for three and a half miles? You know, that would be, I mean, even in best circumstances, right? And so, lots of people. And the, and the temple... Uh, prostitutes, when they got done with worship during the day, would find themselves down in the seaports of Corinth plying their trade. That's why when you read the books of First and Second Corinthians, Paul talks a lot about sexual purity because that was what their city was all about, was immorality. So Paul leaves Athens, comes to Corinth, and, and he's going to uh, come alone, but he doesn't leave alone. God is going to use a number of different people in his life while he's there for Corinth. He's there for at least a year and a half that we know of. A and during that time, God is going to use different people in his life in different ways to really 
uh, work in his life and work in the lives of the Corinthians so that they establish a fairly large church by the time he leaves. So let's turn to Corinthian, or Corinthians. I did that this morning. Acts chapter 18, and let's read the first four verses. After these things, he left Athens, and he went to Corinth, and he found a Jew by the name of Aquila, a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius has commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working. For by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So we, we see Paul, he comes along, and the first thing he does, he goes to the synagogue. That's his normal pattern. He's a rabbi. He goes to the synagogue, and, and he meets... Aquila and Priscilla. But they're, they're not Corinthians. Where are they from? It says they're from Rome. And in 49 AD, Claudius Caesar got so upset because the Jews and the Christians were battling each other over whether Christ was the Messiah. So he kicks them all out. And Aquila and Priscilla end up in Corinth. And it says that they're tent makers. So uh, the likelihood is, is because we never hear about Aquila and Priscilla making a decision for Jesus with Paul, the likelihood is, is that they got saved while they were in Rome. And so now here they are in Corinth, and Paul goes to the synagogue, and he's sitting in the synagogue, and he looks over and sees this couple, and he looks at their hands, and their hands are all callous from sewing hides and th- sewing heavy, heavy material. And their, their hands are stained with the stain that they use to protect the, t- the tents that they make. And he goes, wow, I know you guys are tent makers, aren't you? Look at my hands. I'm a tent maker also. And the interesting thing is, what do they do? Aquila and Priscilla not only open up their home, but their business to Paul. Isn't that? I mean, okay, hey, Paul, yeah, we'll, we'll bring you in as a business partner. Come and help us sew tents. We'll give you part of the earth. You know, you can, you'll, be a, you'll be a partner in our business. They just met the guy. He's, he's living in their home. He's working in the, And can you imagine what it was like? He, every, every Saturday he would go to the temple and he would talk in the temple. And the rest of the week he's busy sewing. And Aquila and Priscilla would go with him and, and then they would get back to the, to the house and they would be sitting there sewing. And, Paul, Paul, why did you tell me about this justification by faith that you talked about at church? Or at synagogue. And Paul would sit there and he would begin to talk about justification. By what, is, what is being saved by grace? What, when you talk about grace and grace alone. And for hours they would sit there. They learned theology at the feet of Paul. How exciting would that be? I mean, they got so, they got so full of theology by Paul. Is that later he drops them off at a church and he says, hey. Teach them. So Aquila and Priscilla, by opening up their homes and their their business, God begins to work in Aquila and Priscilla. And here's Paul. We call it, a lot of times you'll hear people talk about tent maker ministries where people go in and they'll work work in a business all week and then they they will use that to pay for their own way while they win people to Christ, and they start a church. Happens a lot. But it doesn't stay that way because something really neat happens in verse 5. So so watch what happens in verses 5 through 8. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, 
Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And when he left there and went to the house of a man called Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue, and Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord and all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. Wow! So, so remember, Silas and Timothy, they were left in Berea. When Paul jumped on the boat to go to Athens, he said, you guys stay here. These guys need help. And they were not only ministering to those, but they went back up to Thessalonica and they, they worked with them. They may have gone all the way back to Philippi and preached in those churches, but they stayed there for a while while Paul was down in Athens. And, and then while he's there in Corinth, all of a sudden one day they showed up. Because actually Paul had said, hey guys, I, I need you down here. And they finally connect with him in Corinth. Now, they do something interesting. Is when, when Silas and Timothy showed up, they supported Paul so that he could do his share, he could share full time. That's, that's really opening up your heart, isn't it? Hey, Paul, you don't have to work anymore. We're here. We'll, we'll make sure that you have everything you need so that you can go out every day and not only speak to the Jews, but also to all of these, all of these people in this melting pot. Because remember, where these ships are coming in from all over to run across that three and a half miles of land. And so there's people from all over coming here. And Paul has the opportunity to minister to them all. Because Silas and Timothy says, hey, I'm going to support you. Now, you know, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to do that. But Paul and, or Silas and Timothy, they didn't just come and do the work themselves. They brought gifts with them. In 2 Corinthians 8, Paul is going to write this about what happened while he was there in Corinth. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of, con of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participating in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God." The Thessalonians, the Macedonians, the, the folks in Berea and Philippi, and Philippi and Thessalonica, they all put together gifts and they gave so that Paul could preach to the Corinthians. They didn't say, hey, Paul, we're going to send you a one-way ticket to come on back up here and preach to us. They knew that Paul had value to the Corinthians. That, that they could have the opportunity to hear the same word that they heard in their city by allowing Paul to preach full time. And so they send gifts. You know, what, some people wonder, you know, why do you guys have such a, you know, we have 12% of our general budget goes to missions. And some people say, why, why would you send all that money that way? Because folks, we are blessed. I've been to Haiti. Scott's been to Haiti. How do they live, Scott? They have a, they have a, maybe if they're lucky, 
They have a one-room brick house that's maybe 12 by 12. If they're lucky, they have 10 on top of it. Otherwise, it's thatched. And they usually have a, a woven rush pallet to, to lay on. We go to, I can take you to Ecuador and look at this beautiful, beautiful kids down there in Ecuador. And, and I watch these little ones. And, and, you know, they're down there. They've been brought to the orphanage because nobody wants them. They've got, they've got disabilities that nobody wants to take care of. And they come to the orphanage. And we're able to give We recently, uh, the foundation was able to get a new 12-passenger van. Now, before then, they had a seven-passenger van that they would, when they'd take the kids to school, they would put three in a seat, and then they'd pass the little ones back, and the little ones would sit on the big ones' laps until they got everybody full, and then they'd take them off to school, and then they'd come back and make another run. And now they're able to, 12 kids at a time, and I saw these beautiful beaming faces. It got there just in time for school to start. And they're all in their little uniforms. And, and the ones that are in wheelchairs, they are able to take their wheelchairs and collapse them and put them in the back. And then, and then here they are, off to school. And we're able to do that. You know, we're, we're building, we're, we're helping build the forever home. And we got, you know, so when we go and give, it's so that they can hear the word. So that they can be provided for and know that somebody loves them enough that they're willing to, to sacrifice to provide. And what kind of sacrifice is it? I mean, sometimes I think, you know, we have enough bedrooms in this church alone to house every one of those kids. That's, that's something to think about. We could clear the orphanage out tomorrow with all the bedrooms that we have right here in, in Eastside Christian Church and have more left over. We give, the, the Macedonians gave so Paul could preach to the Corinthians. And that's our job. Our job is not to keep what we have right here. Oh, yes, we're the holy huddle. We want to stay right here. We want to be comfortable. We want to provide for our needs. No, God calls us to provide for the needs of others. We've heard the gospel. We have the gospel. We have the word. We need to send it out Amen. everywhere it could go. And not only do, do Timothy and Silas provide the, the financial means for Paul to preach, but they also take on part of the work. You see, Paul's busy preaching, and there's other things that happen when people get saved. Somebody's got to disciple all of these people. Somebody's got to lead the other Bible studies. But one of the interesting things that they got to do was they got to baptize Believers, when they came to Christ. Because 1 Corinthians 1 tells us, for Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say that they were baptized in my name. Because the Corinthians were running around going, I was baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Apollos. I was baptized by... They, were, they got on this thing of who they got baptized by, and Paul says, No. You were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen? You weren't baptized in the name of Paul. That's part of what they were doing. They were taking on all of that role. My job, our job as elders, is, as in, is in Ephesians chapter 4. We are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Yes, we get a, yes, I preach. Yes, the elders take care of things. They teach Bible classes. They do other things. But, but I want you to understand, our job is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. That's why it's so exciting. When I, a lot of times when I baptize people, I want to have the people with them that were responsible for leading them to Christ. Because that, they have a bigger role in that than I do. And that's what Paul, Paul was doing with Thomas, or with Timothy, and Silas, and Aquila, and Priscilla. And in the meantime, they were absorbing all the theology that Paul was pouring out of his mouth. 
Well, let's go on and see what, what happens to, to Paul. Because sometimes when we think, oh man, the ministry's going good, people are getting saved, I'm out there preaching every day. I'm, God's giving me this opportunity and that opportunity. That can be sometimes the hardest time of ministry. Verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer. But go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am am with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you for I have many people in the city and he settled there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them Paul got discouraged it's easy to get discouraged if you think you're alone but even with these others there, Paul felt the burden of the ministry. He had to carry the load. He was the preacher. People looked to him for that. And Paul, it, notice it's, what does it say? He says, do not be afraid any longer. Paul, Paul was like, oh man, every, because I want you to think about his past. He goes to a city and he preaches the gospel and the religious fanatics, fanatics get mad at him and they stone him to death. Another time they don't like it and they beat him with rods and threw him into jail. I mean, this guy has been through it. He's had assassination attempts. He's had to sneak out in the middle of the night. And he's thinking, oh man, Lord, okay, here I am. I'm in Corinth. They're going to come for me. He's afraid. He's scared. He wants to stop. He says, don't, don't be silent. Keep preaching because I've got people here. Isn't that an interesting encouragement? He says, for I have many people in this city. Sometimes when we think, oh, we're all alone. We're carrying the burden by ourselves. Nothing, you know, nobody else is walking with me. You, you, they get discouraged. You know what happened in the Old Testament to a guy by the name of Elijah? Elijah, great prophet. I mean, Elijah healed people, raised people from the dead. He healed people with leprosy. He, he did all of it. He stopped the rain from falling. And then... He, he says, hey, listen, I can make the rain start again. And we all know the story on Mount Carmel where they called for the 450 prophets of Baal to, to offer uh, a, a sacrifice. And, and here's Elijah all by himself over here. And that goes on. And, and God comes down by fire and consumes not only the sacrifice, but the altar itself. And then Elijah says, hey, I'm going to pray for rain. And he goes and he starts praying and he tells his, his servant, go and look. And the servant comes out, I don't see anything. Keep praying. All right, so he's praying, praying, praying. Go look. Uh, there's a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And he says, get up and start running because the rain is coming. And the rainstorm came. Drought was ended after three years. God sent rain for Israel and then little Miss Jezebel puts out a contract on him. Says, I'm going to kill you. And uh, what does he do? He turns tail. You ever see a dog tuck his tail and take off running? That was, that was Elijah. He ran out. He, went, he ran out into the wilderness. And, and he said, God, I'm done. It is Enough. Just kill me. That's what he says in the desert. And God feeds him in the desert. And then he sends him off. And, and we come to 1 Kings 19, 14. And this is, this is Elijah talking to God. And he, then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord 
the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. It's a pretty sad place to be. But you know what God's answer to him was? He says, hey, I have 7,000 prophets of God that I have set aside to help you. You're not alone. And Paul was not alone. He just needed to look as far as, as Timothy and Silas and Aquila and Priscilla. Well, guess what? His, his fear was actually going to come true, which we find out in verses 12 through 17. And I'm just going to give you the highlights here. Guess who gets mad at him? The Jews. The Jews get mad and they come, they, they pull him before a guy by the name of Galileo. He's the pro council there. And just, it says, just as Paul was about to speak, verse 15, 14, but when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, Galileo is, he's not, he's not a believer. He's not a Jew. He doesn't want to have anything to do with God. And he tells the Jewish believers, the Jewish people, you take your nonsense somewhere else. Paul has not done anything wrong, but I want you to know, Paul was ready, he was ready to defend himself one more time. But Galileo, the public leader, the governor of the area, stood up for Paul, and he, and he tells all of those Jewish people, you, you just go away. You leave Paul alone. You know, sometimes we put God in a box. Hey, God, this is the way I want to be healed. Right? Hey, God, this is the way I want you to answer my prayer. Hey, God, this is the way I want things to happen. And we put God in a box and God says, you know what? I got something a lot better than that for you. I'm going to use an ungodly leader To set you free. You're not going to, they're not going to lay a hand on you. And, and all you had to do is look back in the Old Testament to know that that's the way God works. Over and over again, God says, hey, I'm going to use, I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this guy by the name of Moses to set you free. And Moses had been run out of town 40 years before. Sometimes God uses the most unlikely ways to change things. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Now, sometimes, I don't know about you, I get frustrated with what happens in our government. We got a lot of people out there that, that do things that I don't think they should be doing. And, I, and I'm, I'm like, God! Excuse me. Strike him dead. Get him out. God says, you don't know how I'm going to use them. You don't know what I'm going to do through these people. And so I pray this prayer a lot. When I pray for our government and our leaders, Lord, the king's hand is in your heart. You turn it wherever you want. And sometimes we need to pray that God will move that person, that God will send somebody to whisper in their ear and say, hey, you're headed the wrong direction. Or maybe he gives them the Damascus Road experience. Remember what Paul was like before he got saved? Before God intervened in his life? He was mean, he was ugly, he killed people. And God says, not anymore. I'm going to save you, and then you're going to do my bidding. See, God can work if we allow him to. Well, we're, I want to come to the end, and I want you to see what happens. We've watched this. Uh, the title of the sermon was Better Together, right? So we've watched God use Paul in the lives of Aquila and Priscilla. 
and we've watched him use Paul in the lives of Timothy and Silas. So let's see what happens in verses 18 to 22. Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Censoria, he had his hair cut for he was keeping a vow. And they came to Ephesus and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay a little longer time, he did not consent, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. And when he landed in Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. Paul leaves Corinth. Who does he leave there? Timothy and Silas. He didn't take Timothy and Silas with him. He says, you got work to do here in Corinth. They need a lot of help. You know, that's kind of, yeah, they're, they're here in Eastside. Eastside needs a lot of help. We're leaving you there, right? So he left Timothy and Silas in Corinth, and then he sails to Ephesus with Aquila and Priscilla. And you know what he does? He leaves them there. He says, Ephesus needs your help. Do you think as Jewish people, where is Paul headed? He's headed to Jerusalem. He's headed to the temple. As Jewish people, they would have been like, we get to go to Jerusalem with Paul. He says, nope, I'm leaving you in Ephesus because they need you there. And next week, or not, I take it back, I'm not pre preaching on Acts next Sunday out at the farm, so if you don't make it out there, you won't miss it. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be a one-off. I think you'll enjoy it. But uh, anyway, uh, next time we come back to the book of Acts, we're going to see exactly why Paul left Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus. They were needed there. And Paul journeys on alone. He goes back to Jerusalem, sees the church in Jerusalem, and then he goes back up to Antioch to the church that sent him out. And he gives his report. This is what God has been doing for the last three years. Three years Paul's been traveling, preaching the gospel, and now he gets to go home and he gets to tell them this is what God has done. Better together.